Well, hey there, it's Pastor Mitchell here, and I just want to say thanks so much for taking part of your day to spend it here with us online. Whether you are brand new to APBC or if you've been around for some time, uh, we're glad that you are watching today. And if you have any questions about anything we're doing as a church or some of the content uh, that we have for you, I want to encourage you to go ahead and reach out to us. You can leave a comment in the section below, or you can send us a message through Messenger, or you can email me directly at mitchell.deware at gmail.com and we'd be glad uh, to be able to connect with you uh, in whatever way is most helpful. Uh, I want to also encourage you, if you find what we're doing here today helpful for you, uh, to encourage you to go ahead and share that on your social media feeds as well so we can get the word out about the message of Jesus and what we are up to as a church to invite others along on that journey. Now, today in particular, we certainly want to take a moment and say happy Father's Day to all of you dads out there, to all of you granddads, to all of you who play a fatherly role in the lives of so many people. Uh, we hope today that you know that you're celebrated. Um, we hope that uh, you feel encouraged and loved uh, by those around you and that you are celebrated today uh, for the strong role that you play in the lives of so many people. So happy Father's Day to you. As well, just a quick announcement on a couple of things happening here uh, in the life of our church. Of course, with recent changes and phases in the province of Nova Scotia, we've begun to reopen for in-person gatherings. And what that means is on Wednesday nights here at the church at 6.30, uh, we are starting to host midweek prayer meeting Bible study again. So that's 6.30 on Wednesdays. And as well, if you follow our uh, social media on Facebook, you'll notice uh, we've started to update information about Sunday gatherings again. Again. So I'd encourage you to check those out about how to register for those, where they're held, what time. Um, there's some variables depending on rain and whatnot, but we're mostly hoping to be outside through the summer months. And so keep up to date there by following our Facebook page uh, for all information about in-person events, whether it's Sundays, midweek, or other things as well. We'd love to have you along with us in what God is doing in this community and through the places that we can reach around the globe as well. Well, I hope that today's message both encourages and inspires you in taking your next step in trusting in and following Jesus.
Pastor Mark here. So happy that you can be joining us, listening in today. Today we're going to be reading from James chapter 1, verses 19 to 27. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he is. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effective doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless." Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word.
Well, today we are into part two of our series called Words. And if you missed last week's message, uh, I'd encourage you to go back and have a listen to that, whether on Facebook or on YouTube, because it really kind of lays the introduction uh, to where we're headed today. Last week, we kind of broke the ice on this topic of our words and how we should choose them carefully, why it's important that we choose them carefully. Because at the end of the day, uh, what we discovered last week is that our words have the capacity or the power uh, to bring life or death to someone else and also to our own souls. And so, so as we think about the power of words, again, last week we just, we just kind of started into this conversation of why our words are so important. And what we want to do today is just kind of unpack a bit more uh, about kind of practically how we deal with this issue of words and the words that we speak and how we choose them carefully. And so we're going to get uh, a little bit more into the nitty gritty today. Um, and and some of the content of what we have before us as James, the brother of Jesus, lays out uh, in his letter to the church. Uh, some of this content, I just want to say up front, some of it uh, is going to be hard for some of us to hear. Um, and that's what happens when we're confronted with things often that, um, you know, that we need to pay attention to. Uh, sometimes our initial response and reaction is to just kind of shut it off or put it away or I don't want to talk about that. Um, just because there's some things that maybe start to grow up up in us that we don't want to confront or even recognize that are actually there. But I think what James wants to do and what he says and what I want to do today uh, as we kind of take a look at this content is to be helpful for us in how we go about managing the words that we speak. And then uh, for next week, uh, just to give you a bit of a heads up, uh, I think you don't want to miss next week because uh, we're going to be talking about how then we respond to the hurtful words that have been spoken to us, how we deal um, sometimes with past traumas, uh, about kind of the words that have been spoken over us or to us or written about us. How, how do we process through that uh, in a healthy way, in a way that kind of sets us back on a good path and into a good place? And so you don't want to miss that next week as well. But for today, uh, as I said, we're going to move from kind of more concept to, to real application, from more just kind of idea about what our words are and why they're important and how we should choose them carefully to, to how we actually do that. So what does that look like practically? And I just want to say this, that, that it's going to go beyond just kind of that initial response of just shut your mouth. Um, you know, uh, don't say anything that you're going to regret later, you know, just bite your tongue or at least just, you know, think those thoughts and don't say them or mumble under your breath. Like it goes beyond that because at the end of the day, uh, I think as followers of Jesus, our goal should not just to be to repress some of those things, but that there would actually be a change of heart and spirit in us that we don't just go about mumbling under our breath about the things that we don't like or you know the words that we really want to say but we just feel like well maybe I shouldn't um, because that might not be appropriate there's, there's got to be more to it than that there's got to be a, a heart behind that goes beyond just kind of behavioral expectation and and I think that's where James uh, wants to take us you know it's it's kind of like it goes beyond just the spirit of the living God help me to not set something on fire today uh, with what I say. And so so, so, so here's the reality, and, and I think this is a place that we've all been, right? We've all been in a spot or in a situation where we've said things that we wish we could take back. We, maybe it was an immediate regret, or maybe it was a few hours or a few minutes, or, or maybe even a few days or some time later that, and looking back on it, it's like, oh, I wish I just wouldn't have said that. Um, or maybe we've even said things like, well, I didn't really mean it, what I said or how I said it, and you know, but there's, we just carry with us this sense of regret um, because of the words that we have said. And, and, and maybe we tore a strip off of somebody or somebody tore a strip off of us because in the moment we thought they deserved it or they thought we deserved it. Uh, whatever it is, that often leads to whether it's a damaged reputation uh, that you've experienced, whether it is deep division in a relationship uh, as a result, or maybe perhaps even, again, there's this this immediate regret that comes from words that we said. And the hard part is, is that according to James, a lot of it 
can really be avoided. And that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, uh, we used to think about our words sometimes, you know, back, you know, when I was younger, uh, we were often given this illustration of, <clears throat> of a toothpaste uh, tube, right? And, and your words are like the toothpaste in the tube. And the minute that you squeeze the tube, the toothpaste comes out. And, you know, I got a four-year-old right now who loves to squirt his toothpaste into the sink and just watch it go, right? And, and, and you walk into the bathroom and you wash your hands and there's like this big glob of toothpaste still sitting in the sink because it was just, you know, and, and there's a part of me that's like, oh man, he's wasting the toothpaste. But then there's the other part of me that realized, one, you shouldn't put it back because you don't want to reuse that uh, for one. But for two, it's, it's like near impossible to ever get toothpaste back into the tube in the same way that it came out. And, and so with our words, once they're out there, once we've said them, once we've written them, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to take them back. So how do we deal with all of this? Well, James, the brother of Jesus, who, who became a follower of Jesus after the resurrection, uh, who was a pillar in the church of Jerusalem, um, he, in his letter to the early church, has, has a lot of actionable content. And we looked at some of what he said about our words from chapter 3 last week, but today we're going to back it up into chapter 1, because what he says about our words in chapter 1 of his letter um, again, are very practical and I think are going to be very helpful for us today. So let's take a look. James chapter 1, starting at verse 19. And here's what James writes. He says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So, so let's just kind of pause there, back that up, hit the rewind button, and, and, and let's, let's hear that again. Know this, my beloved brothers. For those of you who are in Christ Jesus, who we are in this together, trusting and following him together, know this, every person, every single one of us needs to be quick to hear, or some of your translations might say quick to listen. It's the same sentiment. And slow to speak and slow to to anger. Now, now we might just kind of up front go, well, yeah, well, of course, easier said than done. That's that's a great ideal. That that is maybe something that I think might have been helpful or might be helpful or or something I should strive to. But but the reality is, we all know that that's not often how it works. James says, listen, if if, if we want to choose our words carefully, uh, we need to be the kind of people that up front, first thing, need to be quick to hear or quick to listen. We have to be ready. We have to have the desire to understand what it is either that's going on or what somebody else thinks or feels or is, is walking through in the moment. Our primary response to situations in life should not be quick to speak. It should be quick to hear. It should be quick to listen. And, and when James talks about being quick to listen, he, he doesn't simply mean just biding your time until you have an opportunity to get a word in or, or just waiting it out until you can interject your thoughts in into the conversation. It's not just giving them an opportunity to say something so that then you can have your turn to weigh in. What he wants to foster in us and what, what he wants the desire of our hearts to be is that we would be compassionate enough and caring enough to actually be able to listen and hear from someone else's perspective about what's going on or how they're thinking or what they're feeling. And he says we should be quick to hear because we may have some insight then that we didn't know before. We might be able to hear something or see something or realize something that, that man, if we did not know that, we might have just rolled ahead and caused more damage than needed to be done. And so we should be quick to hear, quick to listen, but slow to speak. And that slow to speak kind of indicates, hey, we should be thoughtful about what we say. Now, I know for some of us, that comes a little harder than others. Some of us, we just tend to want to just blurt things out there, get it off our chest, you know, and just get it out and get it over with. with. Well, some of us kind of tend to, we, we, we recluse a bit. We, we kind of pull away. We need to spend some time to think, perhaps longer than we need to think. Um, but for some of us, but, but, but the reality is, is that James says, hey, you want to be careful about how quick you just start speaking. And we want to be slow to speak, that we choose our words carefully. And in the words that we choose, that we're careful about the assumptions we're making, one of the ways we do that is to be quick to listen and slow to speak. And he says, and slow to 
anger. Now the word here for anger uh, that's used is kind of that thoughtless anger. It's the unrestrained temper. It's the flying off of the handle. It's a fit of rage. It's the lashing out. It's, it's that kind of anger that's, that's very responsive to the moment. And so, so, so he says, listen, we should be slow to anger. And if we're going to be slow to anger, if you have an issue with, with, with being quick tempered, uh, if you've, if you've got an issue uh, with, you know, with, with you just have emotional outburst often, then, then part of what needs to happen is we need to kind of back that train up and go, hey, where do I need to be quick to hear or listen? And then how do I be slow to speak? Because the way, one of the ways that we are slow to anger is if we are quick to hear and slow to speak. The slow to anger almost follows the quick to hear and slow to speak. Now, some of us, again, are slow to hear and quick to speak and quick to get angry. In fact, I would argue that even over, uh, you know, over time, if we're not careful, that can become the pattern of behavior in our lives for, for whatever reason, whatever conditions have led us to that, whatever patterns become the pattern in our lives because of, you know, one decision and another decision and the next moment and the next moment. And, and that's how patterns develop, right? Uh, but for some of us, you know, our when we take a look at our lives, we are not quick to listen. We are not quick to hear. We are you know, not slow to speak and slow to get angry. In fact, for, for some of us, the opposite tends to be what is true of us, that we are quick to get angry and we're quick to speak and, and we're slow to listen. And James tells us then why that is bad practice. He tells us why this should not be the pattern of our lives, particularly for people who follow Jesus. And it might seem obvious the minute that we hear it. Here's what he says. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. In other words, when we are quick to get angry, when we lash out and have emotional outbursts, he says this, that that does not produce the righteousness of God. It does not lead us to right things. It does not lead us to good things. It does not display the character of Jesus, right? And so, so you think about this. Um, when somebody says something that offends, if, if your primary response is to say, well, I don't like that and I'm going to kick over your sandcastle and I'm going to pack up my toys and move to another sandbox. If that's your primary response, James says, hey, that ought not to be so. The anger of man, our, our kind of unrighteous anger, the anger that you know is fueled by response to one thing right away, that, that leads us to, to lash out with rash decisions without thinking things through, leads to irretrievable and harmful words and actions. So, so let me just ask and give an example. When was the last time that your anger ever helped you make a better decision? When was the last time that you were angry about something and the decision you made in that moment was a better decision or the best decision, you know, compared to when you weren't angry? When was the last time your anger ever helped you make a better decision, right? When, when was the last time that, that you realized my anger is helping me to love my neighbor? When was the last time that your anger, when, when you thought about it later, you said, man, my anger really helped me have more compassion for the weak and the hurting. When did your anger lead you to make better decisions and to do the righteous thing? I think if we're honest, it's that kind of anger that actually led us to punch the hole in the wall or punch somebody in the nose. Neither of which I would recommend. So, so, so listen, the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. Let me flip it a little bit and, and ask it this way. When was the last time that your anger actually caused somebody to want to change? When's the last time that, that you yelled at someone or you tore a strip off someone or you just let them know what you think and, and you lashed out and you didn't mince your words, right? And, and the person's response was, Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. that. That's really helped lead me to be a better person. I really want to change because of what you just did. 
right? Like that never happens. Those aren't the kinds of things that, that like that doesn't happen for you and it doesn't happen for someone else. And so, so listen, anger is a miserable town to live in. And James wants us to know that it's, it's not the place we want to build our home, but the reality is that many people do, even though nothing good happens there. And my fear, if I'm just going to be honest with us today, one of my fears is that when we come out of the other side of what we're living right now, that in five years and two years and 10 years, when we look back on these moments in our lives, when we look back on them, the story that some of us are going to tell is those are the years that I just spent angry at the world. I was mad about everything. And we will have little to say about the goodness of God in the midst of it. And I don't want that to be the case for us. I don't think James wants that to be the case for us. And, and so, so James gives us an opportunity for a change of address. And, and here's what he says in verse 21. He says, therefore, put away or get rid of, it's like taking clothing off, right? Set it aside, um, put it back in the drawer, not to be pulled out, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, that is pollution and evil and sin, right? Um, when you think back uh, in um, to Jude, there's a spot there where it talks about ungodly behaviors and ungodly things. And you know what the ungodly description is? The ungodly description is grumbling and complaining and the words that are spoken. It's not the typical list of things that we might think of. And so, so he says, James says here, put away all filthiness, rampant wickedness, and receive then with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And so, so not only do we put it, put something away, but we receive something in its place that it takes the place of what gets put away. And what we are to receive is the implanted word. That is the word of God, the gospel, right? The good news of Jesus, the wisdom that we find in his teaching and in the scriptures. It is the instruction that comes from God. Those kinds of things need to take root in our hearts as we put away filthiness and wickedness and receive the word of God that gets implanted into our souls and grows into something great and beautiful. And James says that not only that, but this implanted word is able to save your soul. Now listen, I don't think that James has in mind here simply that if we believe something, we'll go to heaven. What he's talking about here is beyond that. It's bigger than that. It is a salvation of our souls. You know, there are times when we talk about salvation and when scriptures talk about salvation, that, that God's salvation is, you know, something that he did save us and he is saving us and he will save us. And yes, there is the truth about the fullness of the kingdom of God that, that for those who belong to Jesus, that, that we will walk into at the end of this present age, that, that, that we will enjoy the goodness and the grace of God and the world set right. Like that is true. And that is part of the salvation of our souls. But, but I think what James has in mind here goes well beyond that. It's not about just getting us into heaven. The implanted word, which saves our souls also puts us on a better path. When you think about this in the context of all of what James has to say in his letter, it's about how faith works, about how faith gets put into action, about how faith changes our day-to-day -day lives. It's not just about what happens on Sunday morning when, when we're together or when you're watching or, or, or when you open up the Bible to do your devotions during the week. It's like, how does this save my soul on Tuesday afternoon at 2.30? You know, when, I, when I'm at work or I'm at home with the kids and, and all those kinds of things, when, when this thing is happening or when I'm crumbling under this pressure, how does the implanted word save my soul? And again, it goes beyond just kind of that someday we are going to be with the Lord forever. It is about the salvation of our souls that we walk in now that changes us. And so there's this, there's a sense in which we call it progressive sanctification, that we grow more and more into the image and likeness of Christ Jesus as we trust and follow him. And that is part of the salvation that we experience. So this implanted word not only grows in us, but we grow deeper into it. And so the salvation of our souls really in many ways has to do with what we are experiencing in the here and now the sanctifying work of Jesus. Now, 
What James says next may seem to be a bit disconnected at first, um, but, but it's not. And then he's going to come back full circle uh, just a few short verses later. So stick with me here. Uh, James chapter 1, or stick with James. <laughs> James chapter 1, verse 22. Uh, he goes on to say this, and, and many of us would have memorized or know this verse. We could probably say it you know, off the top of our head. But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. And so, so what is James's concern? Well, James's concern is that we don't just receive the implanted word, that, that it grows in us and, and, and we realize that it's happening. He says, no, there's going to be actionable content that comes as a result. And so we don't just you know, hear the word, but we do the word. We should be acting in obedience. We should be exercising or practicing our faith. And that doesn't just mean sing songs. It means that, that the instruction and the wisdom of Jesus about how we treat people and how we live in this world and the decisions that we make, like those are the kinds of things that ought to represent the character of Christ as we seek his kingdom. That we act in obedience in the day-to-day -day practice of our faith, in the everyday, in the mundane, in the high points, and the low points all around. And so he says, we need to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Not that we just listen and understand and know and can quote Bible verses and can string systematic theology together and you know we can show off our smarts and our understanding. Uh, you know, it's important that we know these things. It's important that we hear things. He's not saying don't hear. What he's saying is don't just hear, do. There's got to be a completion to it, right? It's it, Hearing is important, but it's not the end of the day result. It's, it's not complete without the doing. And James says, if we are doers only, if we are hearers only and not doers of the word, he says, what happens is we deceive ourselves. In other words, we can trick ourselves into thinking that we are actually following Jesus because of what we know. And the reality is, is that being able to quote Bible verses is great. Being able to understand the scriptures is incredibly important. But if that has no transformative power, it doesn't impress anyone. I mean, you think about it, right? That, that's, that's the very definition of hypocrisy that everybody, including Jesus, hates. James goes on and he says this, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, so if, we've, if we're deceiving ourselves, if we're, if we're showing up and we are able to understand it, but we don't practice it, he says he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. In other words, he spends a lot of time with thoughtful attention, looking at, giving consideration to his appearance. And so, so he kind of leans in and, oh, there's another gray hair there. And, you know, there's, there's, there's a wrinkle form in here and my hairlines receding and I got to deal with that acne over there and oh man there's just there's the there's some things that, that just aren't quite right that, that maybe we need to deal with and he says for someone who hears the word and doesn't do the word who doesn't put it into practice he says it's like a person who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror for he looks at himself and then goes away and at once forgets what he looks like in other words he does not do anything about it. Oh, he recognizes it. He can quote it. He can understand it. He even sees the issue. But if he does not address it, James says, that, that, is, that, is, that is false thinking. And we deceive ourselves about our faith when we do that. And so if we can know the Bible, but we continue, as we said last week, to slander, to gossip, to deceive, to boast, that just may very well be that we hear and don't do. You know, look, we're not talking about perfection here. We're not talking about everybody gets it right all the time. Just because we heard it, then we're just going to follow through on it. We all know that we've all fallen short in that. We're not talking about per per perfection, but we are talking about a constant awareness that is marked by repentance. And so when you see those things, when you realize those things, when someone confronts you about those things, then there are adjustments that are made. There's repentance, there's confession, there's an ask for forgiveness, and then there's a changing your thinking and moving in a different direction as a result. You know, if we are just hearers of the word and not doers, it's like, like we bought a bike and we set it on the rack and call ourselves a cyclist. 
And James would just say that, like we would say that's foolish. And James would say when it comes to faith, it's the same kind of thing. Because faith without a corresponding action is actually dead. And it's a hard thing to hear. And it's a hard thing for James to say. And, and I know it's a hard thing for us to kind of wrestle with. Well, how dare he or anyone else, you know, question my faith? But James is pretty honest. If there's no corresponding action, then our faith, it's dead. Now, there are some very haunting words that Jesus says. And I, just me personally, I mean, this isn't, like, this isn't anything that's said in the scripture, that, that these are the most haunting words of Jesus. But, but I think they're some of the most haunting words in all the New Testament that Jesus ever spoke. And, and, and listen to what they are. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So not everyone who calls me Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who, who calls me Lord is really my follower. In fact, we're going to talk about that a little bit next week. We're going to see a hint of that in John chapter 8. But not everybody who calls on my name, right? It's the person who does what I ask, who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. It's the corresponding action. He goes on to say, and on that day, that's the day of judgment, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, again, calling him Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? In other words, didn't we, weren't we even a part of the ministry of the church, right? Like, didn't, didn't we go to spiritual battle? Didn't we, you know, didn't we preach bold messages and didn't we do all kinds of great things under the banner of Jesus Christ under you Lord Lord and Jesus again <clears throat> says I will declare to them I never knew you depart from me you workers of lawlessness I mean if we just let that settle in for a second those are so so hard to hear those words are so haunting and should force us and move us to really evaluate the state of our relationship with God. Not, not just on, on what we can quote or say, but on how we live. And then following those verses, he says this in verse 24, he says, Everyone then, and these are probably more popular, uh, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat against the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And he says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who's built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall because of it. Jesus makes a distinction. The person who is wise, the person who follows me is not just the person who hears my words. It is the person who hears my words and puts them into practice. And I think that James, the, the brother of Jesus, as he's writing this letter to the church, may have these verses in mind in what he says next in chapter 1 verse 25. He says, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. In other words, the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, that, that is freedom from sin and from death because of the gospel of Christ Jesus, that, that Christ died for our sins and was buried, that he rose again and was seen. When we look into what God has accomplished, right, through his law of love, what it is that he has done for us, when we are liberated because of Christ's action on our behalf and he invites us to trust and follow him, when we give our lives and saying yes to Jesus, when that happens, when we look into that law of liberty and when we persevere in it, when we faithfully pursue obedience to Christ Jesus, being not just a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, James says he will be blessed in his doing. In other words, he will be happy and he will be well off and he will very much be the kind of person that is to be envied because he is warring against evil and not being 
being held captive by sin. And the spiritually healthy are not only big eaters, but big exercisers as well. What is true of us physically, of, of, of being careful of what we eat, and of giving regular exercise to that, he says it's also true spiritually that, that what we eat as the implanted word finds its way into us and we begin to live it out and exercise. We're not just hearing, but we are doing and we will be happy and well off because of it. And then James comes full circle in verse 26 and he says this, if anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Now, again, these are, these are heavy words. They're heavy things to hear. They're things that confront us in our spirit and our soul. But, 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 but let me just kind of address it. James is saying, listen, if you think you're religious, now I know religious is, is a bad word in our culture. Religious is kind of one of those words that a lot of people want to, you know, as soon as you hear it, it's like, you know, the defenses go up. It's like, ah, religion poisons everything and all that. What James simply means by, the, by using the word religion is, is he means things that honor God. And so if we're going to be religious, if we're going to be a kind of people that honor God, which is the way that he's using it here, if, if you think you're religious and do not bridle your tongue, if you're not quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get angry, but you deceive your heart, which we already talked about, this person's religion, James says, is actually worthless. It's unreal. It is empty. It is without effect. And in essence, it is godless. It has nothing to do with God. He goes on to say in verse 27, but religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, that in its truest form, the thing that really honors the Lord, what is it that James says? It's to visit orphan widow, orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. That we care for people who are in distress, that we show concern and we show compassion through the practical ways that we live and, and to keep oneself unstained or unpolluted from the world, not shrinking back into patterns of sinful behavior. So let me, so let me say this for us today, that the litmus test of religion, the kind of religion that God accepts is not ritual or knowledge, it's obedience. The litmus test of religion is not ritual or knowledge, it is obedience. What, you know, who you are and what you do matters more than just showing up on what you know. And not only that, but, but how do we respond to this kind of thing? Well, simply be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. That's James's practical advice for the righteousness that God requires. For, for the religion that God desires, for the kind of life that we live. Now, just imagine with me for a minute if we were to get this right. What would change? How would that change the relationship that you have with your kids? How would it change the relationship you have with your spouse or your neighbor or your coworker or that person you've been talking to online or, or the person that you've disagreed with? over fundamental issues for the person who you might even say is your enemy, who is hostile toward you, who actually you know, is proactive in opposing you? What would be different if we were quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry? I think a lot would change. And so, so let me just kind of leave us with these thoughts this morning. If we're quick to listen, Right? I mean, let's be honest, you or me or anyone rolling in with just a commentary or a monologue or an agenda or, a, well, at least they know exactly what I think, that's just not helpful. It's, I don't think it's ever moved the cause anywhere. In fact, in some ways, it often does the opposite. It just repels people. And so when you say things or when I say things like I just can't understand how they could or why they did or let's be honest the reason is because we can't understand we just said it I can't understand why and what would give us understanding maybe if we were quick to listen and so I would suggest to us that being quick to listen one of the things we can do is simply just ask more questions than we give answers 
but not only be quick to listen, but be slow to speak. And again, you know, just kind of interruptions and emotional outbursts, again, are just not constructive. And so when we think about what we say and how we say it, both of those things are so important. When we're slow to speak, we're not only considering what words we speak, but how we say those words. In other words, what we say and how we say it are, are, are very much important. We, we might put it this way. Um, when it comes to uh, doctrine or the teaching of the church, we say that um, there's a difference between sound doctrine and the sound of doctrine, right? There's a difference between sound doctrine and the sound of doctrine, and both of those are important. And, and there's a difference between what we say and how we say it, because both of those things are important. In fact, when Jesus addressed issues, he would often, you know, not often, he always, John says in John chapter 1, uh, verse 14, he says that Jesus came onto the scene, into this world, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Yeah, Jesus spoke the truth, but he also did it with such grace and offering grace in the process. And those should be the things. You know, we tend to be a little more grace or a little more truth, depending on the circumstance. But Jesus was full of grace and truth. And, and the way that he addresses people, we see that over and over. Full of grace and truth. And so just practically, let me say this. If we're going to be slow to speak, one of the things I think might be very helpful for some of us is, is just simply this. That there are some conversations that should not be had via text message or email or on social media because you and I both know and we've both seen how things blow up so quick because you can't hear how someone is saying what they're saying and there are some conversations with your kid with your spouse right? With, with your coworker, with even the, the people that might be hostile towards you, that you need to have face to face and not just by words. Because I think in many cases, a lot of the issues and conflicts that we have could be solved by just showing that compassion and actually having the conversation. And finally, slow to anger means that sometimes you just need to create space. Or maybe sometimes you just got to give space. You don't want to do things or say things in the moment that you're just going to regret later because you didn't give that space, because you were not quick to listen or slow to speak. And so in your anger, don't sin. When you find yourself getting angry, pay attention to that. If you've burnt bridges because of an outburst you've had in the past, or things that you've said. If you have sinned in your anger before, then I would strongly encourage you today, although it may be very difficult to do, to repent, to confess, to approach the person, to have the face-to-face -face conversation and say you're sorry and ask forgiveness and work toward reconciliation. And I know it can be so hard to do because our pride gets in the way. We don't want to be embarrassed. We don't know how they'll respond. But as much as it depends on you and me, we need to live at peace with one another. So be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. I want to wrap up today with the verse that last week we suggested that kind of becomes a prayer for us as we are learning it over these weeks and, and that if you start your day each day this week or even different points through the day that, that this becomes your prayer, I think it'll be helpful for us in being quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. From Psalm 19, verse 14. Again, you can go back and you can, there's a, a photo of this we've put on our Facebook page that you can download and put it as the screen, you know, the wallpaper on your phone, whatever it is that, that you need to do to help you memorize these words. Uh, just let them settle into our souls today, that we would put things off, that we would receive the implanted word and allow that kind of thing to determine our next step. Psalm 19 verse 14 says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be, ple be pleasing or be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. Let me pray for us today. God, I thank you so much uh, for your word to us that's been made available, that we can receive, that can take root in our hearts, that we can know and understand more of who you are and who we are as a result. 
But God, I pray just as James has forced us into thinking about today that we wouldn't just receive the word that we might know it, but that that as it takes root would begin to determine our steps, that it would determine what we put our hands to, how we actually live. And God, I pray today for us that we would not just be hearers of the word, that we would be doers, that it would not be something that we just know, that we, but that we live out and act upon. And God, I pray today for, for those of us who, who struggle uh, with the way that we use our words and who struggle with you know, wrestling through the impact that others' words have had on them. I pray for us today that by your Holy Spirit, that you would do such a work in us that would transform not only our thinking, but our acting. And God, as we engage uh, next week with the, with the concept and the idea of how do we deal with and process emotionally, mentally, and otherwise the words that have been spoken to us, I pray that there will be great freedom found in those things as well. Help us not just to be hearers, but to be doers. Help us to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry, I pray. Amen. Well, grace and peace to you today. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope this has been helpful for us and for you and for me as we reflect on these things and make the necessary course corrections along the way. And we hope to see you back next week for part three as we wrap up our series, Words.